Hello, my name is Talib Kucukcan at the TRT World Forum. We continue our digital debates on the 25th anniversary of the Srebrenica genocide. Today, our guest is Catherine Bomberger. She is the Director General of the International Commission on Missing Persons. Now it's been 25 years since the massacre that took place in former uh, Yugoslavia. More than 8,000 people died and there are reports that there are still uh, missing persons. Today we will be looking at the role of the rule of law in addressing the Bosnian war and the Srebrenica genocide. Catherine, I welcome you on behalf of the TRT World Forum. Thank you very much for joining us today. I would like to start off with the following question. How grey were the human rights violations that took place during the Bosnian war? You were involved in many, I think, projects and also you were uh, in contact with the communities on the ground. Maybe you can also reflect the views of the community as well as yours. Okay. No, thank you. Thank you for having me uh, today, which is a very special day, which, as you know, marks the 25th anniversary of the Srebrenica genocide, which took place on July 11th, 1995. So this is a very difficult day for me, um, and I wish I could be in Podachari today, as I have been every year um, since uh, the burial in Podachari uh, took place. Um, across the former Yugoslavia, um, just to put it into perspective, about 160,000 persons died as a result of the conflicts that raged through the former Yugoslavia starting in 1991 and then on through the region uh, throughout the, the conflict period, including Kosovo in 1999. So 160,000 people died as a consequence of the conflict. Of that number, about 40,000 people disappeared. Um, and within that category, I would include human rights abuses, including cases of persons being forcibly disappeared, which means that state, states or others acting on their behalf are responsible for disappearing individuals. Um, in Bosnia-Herzegovina, of that number, 30,000 went missing, so they had the highest number in the region. And within the 30,000 persons who went missing, uh, 8,000 of those were related to the Srebrenica genocide, where approximately 8,000 men and boys uh, were executed in a number of days, and their bodies were hidden in mass grave sites in eastern Bosnia. So those were grave violations of human rights, which have been investigated, as your previous uh, guests have explained, uh, by the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia, but also by domestic courts and prosecutors in Bosnia-Herzegovina with the assistance and support of ICMP. Uh, we were able to uncover not only the initial crimes that took place in regard to Srebrenica, where near the initial execution sites, but we were also able to uncover the secondary crime of moving those mortal remains from primary sites to secondary sites and we assisted in providing evidence of those crimes to international courts. And I'll explain later how we did that. So we can see that uh, there were uh, a lot of, uh, I think, crimes committed at the time. And there are also other, I think, crimes like, you know, forcing people to move away from their homeland, uh, occupation of lands. Maybe you can uh, touch on these uh, areas as well, because when we talk about, I think, the uh, uh, violation of human rights, it is not only about the missing persons, I think there is a larger picture as you have just uh, described in the beginning. For sure. I mean, people were forcibly disappeared also from their homes. Uh, there are persons that are living, um, that were living once upon a time in Republika Srpska within the Bosnian entity of Republika Srpska that moved to the Federation entity and vice versa. Uh, so there were cases of also rape crimes, uh, torture crimes uh, related to uh, what happened in Bosnia-Herzegovina, but the International Commission on Missing Persons really does focus on missing persons cases um, and the fact that so many cases have been able to have been recovered now as a consequence of you know, many of these years later is really a testament to the work that has been done by governments in the region. So there are many crimes that took place, but we are focusing on missing persons. Right, okay, we will be coming back to, again, the volume of the crimes as far as missing persons uh, are concerned later on. I would like to now focus on the institutional setup, why this uh, um, International Commission on Missing Persons was set up, uh, you know, what you have done in the beginning, what was the mandate, what are the failures or what are the accomplishments, uh, you know, what are the, let's say, hindrances. Can we maybe a little bit talk about the organization itself and how it developed, actually, to address the question? 
Yeah, the, the organization was actually created at a G7 summit in 1996 to deal with the 40,000 people who went missing in the context of the, the former Yugoslavia and the conflicts that took place there. There was an understanding, I think, within the international community at that time that large numbers of missing persons uh, had to be dealt with uh, because having such a high number of missing persons created political instability and would be an impediment to rebuilding states and to peace and stability in the region. And many of those who were part of creating ICNP also remembered uh, World War II and what happened in those wars. So creating a purpose a specific commission to address missing persons for the first time in history and specific to this particular conflict was a very important step, uh, I would say, not only for the conflicts in Bosnia and Herzegovina, but globally for recognizing that many persons have gone missing around the world as a consequence of human rights abuses, uh, as a consequence of conflicts. So establishing the commission was a very important first step and our mandate is to ensure the cooperation of states or governments and others to become accountable for finding missing persons. So we helped Bosnia-Herzegovina, for example, create a missing persons institute by 2005, which allowed uh, the institution of the missing persons institute to find missing persons, regardless of their ethnic, religious or national background, uh, and also to focus on Srebrenica because this was the biggest number of missing persons within the category of missing persons of uh, 30,000 within that country. Uh, we also helped Bosnia-Herzegovina create purpose-specific legislation to secure the rights of families of the missing, who, by the way, are primarily women. As noted with regard to the Srebrenica genocide, uh, it was re really Bosnian Muslim men and boys uh, who were disappeared, who were executed. So securing the rights of female survivors, enabling them to become influencers in this process uh, has been part of our work over the years. So when we look at the work of uh, International Commission on Missing Persons as a process, uh, in the beginning, of course, it was a, uh, an original idea, as you have said. Uh, you know, what were the main impediments on the way uh, to resolve some of the issues? And, you know, to what extent you have really improved and now you can say we set a good example uh, on the foundations of these principles and these practices. Yeah. What would you, you know, you know, how would you describe this process? Well, the main impediment is always politics, uh, unfortunately. And this, this is the case no matter where you are in the world, um, because in many, especially in the case of Bosnia-Herzegovina, because states were implicated or other state actors acting on their behalf, uh, there, was, there was no interest, let's say, in finding these missing persons. And I think it was felt early on when ICMP was created that opening up these mass grave sites uh, would perpetuate uh, the misery of people uh, that would you know, continue to you know, haunt them for the rest of their lives. But it's important actually to take these steps forward, to excavate these mass grave sites, uh, to provide an element of truth, to have an honest reckoning about what happened. So I would say that the main impediments become political and politics and revisionism of history, uh, providing you know, uh, uh, you know, irrefutable evidence was important to ensuring an understanding of what happened in Srebrenica. So being able to uncover the truth and to ensure state responsibility in this process was a very painstaking process. And in order to do this, we also assisted Bosnia-Herzegovina, and this is because of Srebrenica, because of the condition of the bodies uh, once we arrived there, uh, to use uh, advanced DNA technologies and data systems capabilities and to apply these to the cases of Srebrenica. So providing that element of truth and helping the state create institutions to find all missing persons, to create central records of those who went missing, to provide reliable and accurate information to their citizens regarding the numbers and circumstances of the disappearance is, is absolutely critical uh, to accounting for the missing and to helping societies move on. Right, you know, in the beginning when you explain the volume of the crimes as far as missing persons uh, were concerned, I think it was a bleak picture. You know, everybody talks about this Rebzenica at 8,000 people were missing. But as you have said, it was about 40,000 people missing, mostly in Bosnia-Herzegovina. 30,000 people were missing there. Now you have uh, discovered, eight. We, we know what happened to 8,000 8, people. You know, they yeah. were in mass graves, etc. Uh, but what happened to the rest of the people? I mean, now we have got lots of technologies. We have got, you know, uh, uh, 
very uh, 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 important technological, I think, uh, gadgets, uh, news, uh, collection, uh, maybe the um, uh, all these uh, uh, instruments are available to us, but there are still people who are missing. Why we cannot find them? Yeah, let me put this into perspective. It's an excellent question. Um, what Bosnia Herzegovina and the states within the Western Balkans, uh, who were part of the former Yugoslavia, have been able to do is remarkable. Of the 40,000 people that I mentioned earlier that went missing as a consequence of the conflicts that took place in the region, today, over 70% of those people have been accounted for, which is unprecedented. That's never happened anywhere else in the world. And of the 8,000 Muslim men and boys who were executed in the Bosnian, in the Srebrenica genocide, ICMP has helped Bosnia Herzegovina reliably, scientifically identify almost 7,000, which means um, almost 90% of the 8,000 men and boys that were killed. This has never been done before, providing evidence of a genocide, which we use scientific means, uh, which provides, as I said earlier, ir irrefutable evidence of identity, which we were able then, using DNA technology, to link back to the original crime scene and to the multiple locations uh, which bodies had been removed to by the perpetrators who went back to the original sites and moved the bodies of these victims to multiple secondary sites, sometimes 50 kilometers away from each other. So without DNA technology, which ICMP used for the first time in history because of what we were confronted with with Srebrenica, we then applied that technology throughout the former Yugoslavia but we embarked on the use of this new technology because of the horror we were confronted with with Srebrenica. And I think, you know, I've been with ICMP since 1998. We never thought this would have been possible to uncover the truth, to use science, uh, to find that many people. I still have to pinch myself to, to remind myself that this was possible, but we didn't do this alone. In order to find such a high number of missing persons, we, we had to collect genetic reference samples from families of the missing uh, who were traumatized, who were primarily women, uh, who were scared, who understood nothing about this new technology, as most of us don't, uh, to educate them um, about this new technology and about their rights and to engage them in this process. We ended up collecting data from 100,000 families of the missing in Turkey as well, because many of these families were living as diaspora in Western Europe and North America and in Australia. So in order to identify this many people, it required excavating 3000 mass grave sites, which local officials were involved in, where evidence was collected to a level where it could be provided in an international court and domestic courts. It involved, as I said, families of the missing, providing a blood sample, which became an extremely powerful symbol, especially for mothers, to provide a piece of themselves, a blood sample, to find somebody that they loved. So all of these things uh, were, I mean, this is a meticulous effort, which we took in partnership with families, with states, with prosecutors, with judges, uh, with the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia. So this was a very meticulous process where we can say, with, without a shadow of a doubt, we provided irrefutable evidence, reliable ev evidence of, the, of their identities, uh, which I hope has contributed to truth and justice, and also has allowed families of the missing to bury a loved one in Podachari, which is what they're doing again today, 25 years later. There's still a few you know, missing persons cases with regard to Srebrenica. There are about 800 to 1,000 persons still missing. Uh, we've tried everything to find the remaining mass grave sites with the help of many governments that have been supporting us. Uh, we're trying to leave no stone unturned to find these mass grave sites, but it has been difficult. And there are still 12,000 people missing in the entire region. It, those, the numbers have gone down because the vast majority have been accounted for. So finding new mass grave sites has been difficult, but we're confident that this will continue to happen. Right. I was going to ask you, actually, you, you know, briefly uh, made reference to it. You know, when you collect evidence, you said you shared it with the national and international courts and, uh, you know, legal organizations in order to bring people to justice. To what extent that was helpful in bringing people to justice and also <laughs> to increase accountability? Huge. I mean, I think what happened in the former Yugoslavia serves as a model for the rest of the world. Uh, 
with when we t collect a reference sample, genetic reference sample from families of the missing, we do this with their express written permission. So in order for us to share this with a third party, including a domestic court in the region or at the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia, we have to receive their express written permission to do so. Uh, in 2006, the trial chamber asked us for this evidence, including genetic uh, reference samples, which is private information, which belongs to a family of the missing. And as you know, Karadich himself, uh, who has now been, uh, you know, charges against him for genocide have finally come to fruition. Uh, he also mounted his own defense. So families of the missing were put into an awkward situation, especially those from Srebrenica, where they were asked to supply their own private information, including their genetic data to the perpetrator. And what is amazing, um, and, and we did this with their permission because we had to go back to three, I mean, 1,500 families of the missing. Karadich uh, selected 300 cases randomly. And with their permission, we went back to the families of the missing. We asked them for their written consent. You know, would they share their data with the perpetrator? And in almost 100, percent of these cases, they agreed to do this, which I think is the most powerful statement uh, that the families could ever make of the, the right and their need for justice. And, and this has to occur throughout the world, and this should be a model for the rest of the world. I think that's an amazing work that uh, you have done. And also you said that you did not do it on your own. There were international support. What was the network of support in this case in finding uh, missing people in uh, uh, former Yugoslavia? Well, the, the, the world was a different place in the 1990s when we started our, our work. I mean, there was more of an international community at that point. So there was a lot of support, uh, I would say, in concert with the international community that existed at that time. So uh, whether it's government such as Turkey, the United States, uh, many Western countries, many of those in the Middle East. So there was a community of support to help at that time, which sadly does not exist today. I mean, this is a much more fractured world today than existed at that time. Um, also, you know, the period that ICMP was created was the 1990s. And you have to remember that the 1990s really do, and this is important for your program, especially with the speakers you had previously, the 1990s represent a historical shift in the way we address the issue of missing persons and atrocities committed by states or other perpetrators. Uh, during this period, the ICTY and its counterpart for Rwanda were, were created in 1993. The International Criminal Court was created in 1998. So we worked together with the court, as I mentioned earlier, and domestic courts to find missing persons. We also worked together with the Office of the High Representative, so with other organizations, the OSCE, to ensure uh, that we work together uh, harmoniously to help states rebuild and part of rebuilding Bosnia um, became important in terms of building the institutions of good governance such as the Missing Persons Institute or the War Crimes Tribunal uh, and the work of Bosnian authorities uh, to find missing persons uh, and to provide reliable and accurate inf information to their citizens is of paramount importance because this is an investment in truth and stability. So states must take that responsibility, not only in Bosnia Herzegovina, but everywhere in the world where there are, there is no country in the world that doesn't have a missing persons problem. Each and every single country has a missing persons problem. ICMP became a treaty-based international organization in 2014. We're now in the city of The Hague. We moved our headquarters from Sarajevo to The Hague, where we're working globally now around the world using the same principles that we've applied in the Western Balkans globally. Well, I think uh, what I read from your comments is that because the international community is fractured, because the multilateralism is under threat, now the uh, remaining missing people, like 12,000 people you have mentioned, uh, it seems that um, we are going into a more um, you know, pessimistic days in finding those people, because when you cannot find them, you can really uh, tell anything to their families and they cannot uh, you know, breathe. Uh, so what is your view about the remaining people, given the you know, uh, fractured uh, situation in the international fora? Well, I think, the, 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 and also I wouldn't even just say, as I said, on an international level, but even within the Western Balkans, it's very fractured right now, and it has been. So even though an unprecedented number of persons have been accounted for, and really through state involvement and cooperation between those states, 
when you're dealing with other issues beyond missing persons, it's a very difficult and very politicized forum. However, uh, because our, our mandate is to secure the cooperation of governments, what we've been able to do is not only to help states build institutions to account for missing persons, not only in Bosnia, but also Croatia, uh, Serbia, Kosovo, uh, other areas, Montenegro, where there are commissions on missing persons, but we've helped those states cooperate together. So together, each one of the countries that forms a former Yugoslavia have formed a missing persons group. We facilitate uh, that group uh, by ensuring that they come together on a regular basis uh, to exchange information and to stop the finger pointing. They must work together. Without their ability to work together, we will not find the remaining 12,000 missing persons. It's, it's absolutely essential that they work together. As an international organization, we can support their work, we can facilitate that work, um, and we can help them uh, you know, work together to harmonize that work. Well, Catherine, you uh, have, uh, I think, briefly uh, addressed the question that I am going to ask you, but I will still ask it to just clarify some of the points that I would like to discuss with you. So what is involved in identifying these missing persons? It is uh, the technology, as you said, maybe the politics, the networks. Uh, what is the, let's say, uh, you know, uh, overarching uh, principles and uh, procedures uh, in order to identify these people? Okay, Let me, so there's several elements. Number one, there has to be state responsibility. The state must want to do this. When the state does not want to do this, then we work with civil society organizations uh, to help the civil society organizations become active and become influencers in the process. But because these mass grave sites are located in a state, the state has to take responsibility. Uh, the second issue is that uh, all states are, should be responsible for investigating missing persons cases, regardless of where we are in the world. So proper institutions to investigate missing persons cases to a standard where evidence can be provided to an international uh, court uh, is absolutely key to this. Third, as I said, the engagement of families of the missing is critical. Um, and often they feel scared, and this is very important. Uh, and you know, many of the women of Srebrenica, for example, when I first met them, and they are my teachers, by the way, I learned from them, they were scared. Uh, so in ensuring that they are able to understand their rights, that they're brave enough and courageous enough to take on their governments, to hold them to account is critical. These things have to happen. Going back to state responsibility, often when states take that responsibility, and that's a courageous step for any state, they often don't know how to address this issue. So creating purpose-specific institutions, creating legislation, and Bosnia has done many firsts in this. They're the first country to create a missing persons institute, uh, to find all missing persons, regardless of their ethnic, religious, or national origin. They're also the first country in the world to create a law on missing persons that secures the rights of families of the missing, again, regardless of their ethnic, religious, or national origin. So those are the basic ingredients. Once you have that, you can apply advanced technologies, which is what we did. As I said, we began using DNA because of the circumstances we were faced with with Srebrenica. Uh, when we started, we didn't know if it would work. So this required two components. Number one, um, when mass grave sites are excavated, uh, you take a bone sample from the skeletal remains, uh, and we were able to set up a laboratory system, which is now here in, in The Hague, uh, where we extract DNA from bone samples. So you have a, a genetic profile from the bone samples. So we have a DNA laboratory system that conduct, conducts high throughput testing, or we can do many cases, which is you know, not a, a normal laboratory. It's dedicated to human identification. So taking a, a genetic profile from the bone sample on a technical level is the first step. The second part of that is collecting a reference sample. As I said earlier, providing a blood sample uh, from families that the missing became a very powerful symbol, it became very important for especially female survivors. But you can also take a saliva swab. So finding large number, if you have, it's like throwing out a broad net uh, because the mass grave sites were in the Western Balkans, but the families of the missing were living in many, many places from Australia to Canada. So having a centralized data system capability where we could work with families of the missing no matter where they were to upload data, including genetic data, became important. Then in our laboratories, we're doing high throughput matching, which means we're trying to match blindly. 
I mean, our system is completely blinded because we're working with many countries, 40 countries around the world. Um, so we match these samples to each other. For us to get a level of accuracy that we're comfortable with, we require a 99.95 .95, uh, level of matching between the genetic profile obtained from a post-mortem sample and that obtained from a family of the missing. In the cases of Srebrenica, this is very important, only DNA was used. So we have scientific evidence of a genocide, we have irrefutable evidence that the bodies were moved to multiple secondary sites and we can tell this through, through DNA testing. So in the case of Srebrenica, actually, uh, we had a higher rate than even 99.95 um, in mo most cases related to Srebrenica. When we're able to get a DNA match report, uh, we deliver that DNA match report back to the authorities that we're working with. So in the case of Bosnia Herzegovina, the DNA match report is delivered to the Missing Persons Institute, which is then responsible for closing the cases and working with court-appointed forensic pathologists who also then look at cause and manner of death. And this is also important in the case of Srebrenica, and we can get to that, uh, to close the case and then inform the families. Now, the issue with Srebrenica is that one year, you would find one small piece of a bone sample. In another year, you might find another and then another. So every year, imagine a mother every single year having to go through this process of burying her son again and again and the trauma related to that process. And that was something we hadn't foreseen. So using DNA uncovered the secondary crime. Um, but in the end, so many of these families, I mean, if you go to Podachari today, uh, and I wish you could show this on your television program, without DNA technology, these, these headstones, of which there are almost 7,000 in Podachari, would not be there today. So every single tombstone, every single case that's been buried in Podachari has been subjected to rigorous scientific procedures that have allowed families of the missing to bury their loved ones there. If I may say so, in some cases, these women had nothing left. There's one woman from Srebrenica, for example, um, all that she had left of her son, her 12-year-old son, was his fingerprint and, you know, these small Nivea cans, uh, her, his fingerprint in that Nivea can. That's all she had. The house was gone because it had been destroyed in the war. All her documents had been destroyed in the war. She had gone completely mad because she had no physical proof anymore to prove the existence of her son. And imagine being lied to by a government that your son never existed. I mean, the horror of this, I mean, it's, it's a form of psychological trauma for families of the missing. So using DNA technology, we were able to help these families of the missing, again, have their sons back, even though they were dead, to bury them and to have justice. And this is very powerful. It also is important for memory. I mean, people say science is cold, uh, the DNA is cold. In fact, it's, it's the warmest thing you can do because somebody provides a bit of themselves to find somebody that they love. It's the most human thing that you can do. Well, actually, when you look at the consequences of the scientific work, you can really see the warm side of the, I think, uh, investment that you make in science. And it seems that it, it's a you know, fascinating work. It is a very meticulous and also very sophisticated, as you have said. I mean, it involves you know, many countries, you know, many, many communities and, uh, and technology. You know, what you have described is very painful, of course. I mean, you said sometimes the mothers, the you know, uh, people uh, had to go through different stages of uh, you know, uh, painful uh, experiences. Now, of course, we need to a little bit, uh, you know, focus on the possibility of reconciliation under such, you know, painful circumstances. Do you do you see that there is a chance for reconciliation, or this is just a myth? I don't think it's a myth, but I think what it requires, and if you look at Jacinda Ardern in in uh, uh, New Zealand um, after what happened in the mosque, I think these are cases where, with good leadership. If you stand up and provide good leadership, you can bring people together again after these horrific circumstances. Uh, and while you know the states in the Western Balkans have done a lot uh, to, as I said, it's unprecedented to account for missing persons. In terms of reconciliation, that leadership isn't there. Um, unfortunately, the victim card is played by all sides. 
The denial of Srebrenica, as you know, continues to exist, which is extremely painful for families of the missing, but that denial goes beyond Srebrenica. And so long as this happens, so long as mass grave sites and missing persons cases are used for political ends, and that's the tragedy, so long as this continues to happen, there will be no reconciliation. But I can tell you something, because I've worked with families of the missing from all sides, they want to work together. They do work together. They formed a regional group of families of the missing. Sometimes it's difficult, sometimes you know they're weary, sometimes they're angry. But if they can do it, the state should be able to do it. And that is the problem. Politics gets in the way. The founders of the missing deserve better. You know, you said the international community has really uh, contributed to your work in finding the missing people. But it seems that when it comes to the reconci reconciliation projects, uh, maybe the international community should do more. Because as you have said, the communities would like to have some kind of reconciliation. They are ready to move and they are ready to maybe forget the past, not completely, but at least to the extent that they can uh, become neighbors again or they can become friends again. So what is your advice to the international community as far as the reconciliation bit is concerned? Because national governments are not very willing. Not to give up. I mean, we have to continue. So the international community, wherever it's operating, has they have to, number one, remain united, <laughs> which is a tall order at the moment. Uh, because without that unity, uh, what's happening in Syria, what's happening in different parts of the world will never be addressed. I mean, that unity is required to combat this type of hatred that leads to gigantic numbers of missing persons going missing globally. And, and that is sad. Uh, the rule of law must continue to work. We must make an investment in this as the international community. States often cannot do it on their own. Um, and sadly, that is the case at the moment. We must be united. And that unity existed for a brief period of time. And I think the Balkans specifically were able to reap the benefits of that. And then that disappeared. But that must continue to happen. Um, the Western Balkans is not on its own. I mean, missing persons cases are happening everywhere in the world uh, to a large extent. There are 120,000 people missing uh, in, from the Colombian 50-year conflict. Uh, there are over 100,000 people missing from the ongoing Syria conflict. Uh, there could be up to a million people missing uh, from Iraq, um, from wars with neighboring states, Libya, etc., cetera, um, in this region. So Africa, I mean, the, the issue is enormous. So it requires states to take responsibility, but within those parameters, the international com community must also be united. And organizations like ours that our treaty-based international organizations. It would be good if Turkey and other states acceded to our treaty to demonstrate to the world that type of unity of action on these missing persons cases, no matter where they are. I think you described the global picture very, very succinctly. I can see that you know this problem is a global issue. And also that remind me, reminded me of a recent report released by the Parliamentary Assembly of Council of Europe uh, members of the uh, parliament released a report on the missing children, actually. Missing uh, children in, in Europe, uh, they uh, claim that thousands of uh, children are missing and they are at the heart, heart of Europe. And I think this is something, you know, one cannot imagine. And there is not a war there, there is not a conflict there, but still, uh, so we have got a significant number of children are missing and these are recognized by many national governments. Uh, how does that happen in, in this modern world? I mean, when there is such a surveillance, when such a you know, border control, etc., cetera, in, in, uh, in the world? Why that happens and, you know, what can we do about finding them? Uh, because, you, you, as you said, you know, you have uh, a lot of experience in, in finding missing people. Of course, one cannot uh, make a similar uh, case with this Srebrenica. That's a completely different case but the missing persons is a reality. So we need to also maybe uh, address that challenge as well. Absolutely. I'm very glad you mentioned that. Um, in fact, when ICMP became a treaty-based international organization, uh, for the first time in history, our treaty mentions uh, the obligations of states to find missing persons, whether they're missing from war, human rights abuses, disasters, meaning man-made or natural disasters, uh, organized crime and migration and other causes where persons go missing for involuntary reasons. Um, in Europe, Europe today has the highest number of dead and missing migrants in the world. 
20,000 dead and missing migrants are missing in Europe at the moment, many of them dead in the Mediterranean and missing. Uh, so this is a huge issue for Europe. Um, and as with other places in the world, states have to take responsibility uh, for finding missing persons. And in the case of Europe, under international law, for finding missing persons, whether they're citizens or non-citizens. And this is the tragedy of today's world, especially in the West, also in North America, um, all states have to take responsibility for finding missing persons, whether they're minority groups, including migrants. So this is a big issue for us. And in fact, um, we launched a project uh, in 2018 in Rome, uh, which we call the joint process, where we're encouraging states to take that responsibility within the Mediterranean, you know, starting because the numbers are so high and people are coming from 85 different countries uh, into the central Mediterranean and now into the Western Mediterranean. So, you know, these are big cases. So, I mean, this is a problem. And this is a problem with Bosnia because Bosnia gets its, you know, the finger pointed at it. Uh, having 30,000 people go missing is enormous. So building the infrastructure within a state to account for such a high number, including the technological know-how is huge. So when you're looking at Europe again, I mean, the last time Europe had to face a situation like you know, such large numbers of missing persons was World War II and then the Bosnian conflict. So now dealing with 20,000 people who are dead and missing migrants, again, states have to build a capacity to deal with this issue, but that also requires political will. So we are building you know, capacity, hopefully across the Mediterranean. Um, I've also discussed this with, with Turkish authorities. It's very important that states take that responsibility no matter where you are in the world and no matter what the circumstances are of the disappearance of that individual. Catherine, do you believe that the, the world is taking lessons from the Srebrenica case? Not necessarily in the, in, in the missing persons area, but as a general in addressing conflicts and also in addressing the post-conflict situations. I think there is a movement now um, since the 1990s, as I've noted, uh, and it continues in the world uh, to take that responsibility. Um, I mean, we, we have been approached, for example, by Ukraine uh, to offer help. We're working with Syrian families of the missing uh, to try to build their capacity to address this issue. We're working in Mexico. As I said earlier, we're working in Colombia. Uh, we continue our work in the Western Balkans. We're also working uh, with countries in Europe, you know, most in the Mediterranean. So while atrocities have not stopped, unfortunately, they continue. I think the way we deal with them now has changed. And I hope that that won't stop. <laughs> I hope we will find a way to make sure, and ICMP will remain on the forefront of this to make sure that states continue to take that responsibility. Well, I think it is uh, very good to hear from you that uh, the uh, states should take more responsibility in addressing such you know, important questions and challenges. And also, as you have said, there are many conflicts all around the world. You know, next door to us, for example, in Syria, you know, lots of uh, conflicts are going on and Turkey is hosting the greatest number of people. And also in Yemen, in Libya, in many other uh, places. And I hope that uh, your work will lead to a more constructive debates and uh, you know policy uh, decisions. Thank you very much for joining us, uh, Catherine Baumberger, Director General of ICMP. Uh, it's a, it was a great pleasure to host you at the TRT World Forum. Thank you for joining us. This is to our audience. Uh, we hope that we will uh, come back together to discuss important issues on the digital debate series. Goodbye. Thank you very much.